I thought everyone was kidding about Sid. I thought maybe it was an elaborate prank started by my mother, perpetuated by my sister, and reinforced by my grandma who was always poking fun at him. Your cousin Sid talks to a mannequin on his front lawn. Your cousin Sid collects wigs for his new girlfriend. Your cousin Sid is dating a sex toy. But the photos were what convinced me. Particularly the one where Sid winked at the camera as he was kissing a bright white ear. An ear far too shiny and glossy to be human. It was part of a series of photos on Facebook labeled Anniversary. In each one, Sid was situated next to a figure he had blurred out in Photoshop. Him and the figure could be seen kneeling at a picnic, and then seated at a park, and then finally standing at his backyard, overlooking an orange sunset. The blurring had been done to protect her privacy according to his comments. It was those pictures posted so brazenly in the eye of the public that made me worry for my cousin after all. I DM'd to ask what this anniversary was all about, merely trying to be polite. Ten minutes later I got his response. Sydney. Hey, good to hear from you Gabe. This was Isabel and I's 13-month anniversary. We decided to share our most auspicious day with our friends and family as an introduction to our relationship. Me. Congrats. I heard you might be seeing someone. I hope they are nice. Sydney. Mm. Isabel is my pure and chosen. We are destined for each other. I sincerely hope the world can accept Yiz and I's love for each other. Me. Glad you found someone. Sydney. I have. I'll be honest, Gabriel. Until I met Yiz, my conception of love was all wrong. I was looking for the wrong thing. I feel like I'm finally mature enough to understand the part of me that has been missing. It's like my whole life has been a dress rehearsal for meeting Yiz. And now that I have, I am reborn anew. I have a clear understanding of life, my place in it, and the direction of the future. Isabel has revealed my greatest and truest value to the universe. And with her love at my side, anything is possible. Would you like to meet her? Me. What? Sydney. We've been keeping our relationship low-key, but it's time that she met some of my family. You're the first to reach out. I would really appreciate it if you would visit. Then you could spread the word of how amazing she is. It would truly do wonders to help convince my parents to visit Isabel too. Please, would you come visit us, oh Gabriel? I should mention, it did not feel like I was talking to the Sid that I knew. The Sid that I knew talked about Pokemon, Marvel movies, and anime I'd never heard of. Sure, he was introverted, and sure, he could have some weird opinions, but he was really just a typically nerdy IT guy who mostly kept to himself. This monologuing and, oh, Gabriel shit was all new. And honestly, it was frightening. I was concerned he'd fallen for some new agey scam or cult or god knows what. So, out of familial obligation, but also morbid curiosity, I decided to agree. I promised I would visit for dinner in a week. It was a breezy hour and a half on the highway. Sid lived about three townships away. And as far as I knew, he was still renting that same basement studio space he had always lived in ever since he moved out in his late thirties. I remember how shocked his whole family was. No one thought he had the self-reliance. But lo and behold, he had rented a whole thousand square foot studio all to himself. When I pulled up in the driveway, I could see it pop up from around the fence. 
Gabe! So glad you could make it. Hey, good to see you, man. We clasped hands and patted each other's back. Sid was never much of a hugger, so I was surprised how hard he embraced me on this occasion. At first I thought it may have been a veiled plea for help, like he was desperate for something. But as soon as we let go, I saw his face. He was beaming, genuinely overjoyed by my presence. She's going to be so happy to see you. She's going to love you. I smiled and tried not to be weirded out by the comment. Instead, I revealed the bottle of red and white wine I brought for the occasion. I didn't know which you'd prefer, but I figured options would be- Isabel doesn't drink. Oh, well. I also brought non-alcoholic lager that I'm a big fan- Isabel doesn't drink. He looked at me, slightly annoyed, as if I hadn't heard him the first time. I wasn't sure what he meant by the comment. But then, after a brief consideration, I believe I understood completely. Right, of course. Isabel just doesn't drink. No, not at the moment. But this is something that may change. I looked at him dead in the eye, to get a sense if he was joking about any of this. He wasn't. I left all the drinks in my car. We ventured to the backyard of the house, and there, with a descending stone staircase, I could see his entrance to the basement flat. Please don't mind Isabel's lethargy. She's been busy in the yard all day, so she'll remain seated for the next little bit. I wanted to laugh. This was already sounding so ridiculous, but I also wanted to play along to see where this was going. So I simply smiled and nodded. As soon as I went through the door, however, my giggles vanished, replaced by a tight constriction in my chest. Sitting across the entrance was a person-sized porcelain doll. She was laying a little ragged, with eyes wide open, black pupils gleaming with a shine I had never seen. Something about seeing a doll that large I found immediately disturbing, as if there was a possibility that maybe a psychopath was hiding inside, pretending to be limp. As you can see, she's a bit zonked. <laughs> Sid went over and petted her hair, both of her eyelids fluttered downwards like the rocking mechanism in any porcelain doll. She'll be up in a few minutes. Just a quick power nap. Of course, I said and then darted over to the dinner table, which was littered with Warhammer figures. I seated myself, facing away, trying to hide my fear of an oversized toy. So basically everyone was right. Sid is seeing a doll. Good lord. I'll start heating up the food. He grabbed a store-bought pre-roasted chicken from his fridge and set it into the oven. His suite was the same disaster I saw when I visited seven years ago. Soda cans littered everywhere, including on his unmade bed. Bobbleheads and Funko Pop standing on every conceivable surface including the wall-to-wall -wall shelves that made me feel like I was in some poorly run museum. The place was still very much Sid's. Except now he had a giant doll on the couch. So, uh, where did you find her, exactly? I cut to the point. Sid clicked some dials on his rice maker. Isabel? I met her in the field. The... IT field? No, no. Just the big grass field. Beyond the yard. I turned to look out his small basement window. Although it was lightly fenced off, Sid's yard connected with a large grassy plain. City property. Underground reservoir, I think. So, you just found her walking around on her own? 
through the grass. Sid sat across from me, picking up some Warhammer figures. Yes, well, I was getting out to photograph my Tyranids in the bush, and before I knew it, some of my figures started to move on their own. Like this. He put down a soldier, and I watched as it slid across the table, as if dragged by a magnet. The little space marine ended up in my hand. Uh, what does this have to do with the Isabel? Then all of my figures started moving, surrounding me in a circle. It was, it was unreal. And when I finally looked up, Isabel was standing there, overseeing everything. I lifted the tiny marine, inspected the underside of the circular base, then dropped it immediately. What the fuck? Beneath the figure's base was a pulsating black ooze, jutting with countless spiky hairs. The hairs grabbed onto the table's surface and pulled the figure upright again. I see you found them. <laughs> the Mikrites. The, the Mike what? Everything in my house has them. Watch. Sid stood up and patted his leg, whistling across the room. Oh, vault boy! A yellow and blue bobblehead skittered across the floor like a demented spider until it was at Sid's feet. He leaned down and gave it a pet. You mind tidying daddy's bed? The bobblehead bobbled, then it scurried over to the sordid sleeping space. Black gunk tendrilled from beneath the toy's base, entering the empty pop cans and moving them away. Then, like a pair of disembodied hands, the ooze also lifted and folded the covers of Sid's bed. At this point, I was standing up in my chair, thoroughly freaked. Are they... Uh, bugs? No, no. They're a part of Isabel. Little essences of her. I turned to the sleeping doll, noticing her head twitch just a little. You're saying Isabel is filled with them? No, no. Isabel is the Mycrites. I moved away from a Gundam figure near the table leg, not wanting to be near any toy whatsoever. I know it's a lot to take in. I was scared at first too. But you see, Isabel is just a person like you or myself. I gave him a look that said, you've got to be shitting me. Hear me out. Isabel is from a place where they're beyond the need of bodies. She won't say where, but I do know it's somewhere near the Pleiades star cluster. My jaw dropped further. So she's an alien? Not quite. It's more like her consciousness has been uploaded to a colony of nanomachines. She's a person whose thoughts are now in a liquid robot that arrived here hundreds of years ago. Both my hands glued themselves to the top of my head. It was the most incredulous I had ever felt. Uh, okay, you, you keep calling her a person, but all I've seen is black ooze around your house. She's very much a single entity. The majority of the Mycrites inhabit that porcelain body. She's attached to it, and can you blame her? It's gorgeous. 19th century China, I think. As he said the words, I could see the doll begin to stir. Her arms lifted above her head. Was she stretching? I backed away instinctively heading for the door. I was halfway there when Isabel suddenly stood up on two feet and stared at me. I froze. As far as I could tell, her head and limbs were made of porcelain, but her torso and joints were made of soft fabric, like any old Victorian doll. There must have been bucketfuls of those mycrites inside 
filling her with the muscle and sinew she needed to lift, move, and blink at me with those glassy cold marbles. Gabriel Worthington. Her mouth lowered and lifted like an antique puppet's. It is a pleasure to finally meet you. I was too afraid to turn back now. My eyes were glued. Won't you be joining us for dinner? I've heard so much about you. Her voice sounded like what sand might sound like if it learned to talk. D-dinner? Uh, yeah... Sid walked over to his rice maker and gave a thumbs up. How glorious! The rice is ready. I'll get the cutlery. You might think I sat at the dinner table because I was still curious, and that I was trying to help my cousin by learning more about this otherworldly partner by understanding their relationship but that was not the case. I sat at the dinner table because I saw a shadow drip off the ceiling and pool around the doorknob of the exit. I could sense that Isabel perhaps may not let me leave, that Isabel perhaps really wanted to have dinner with me, and that Isabel was someone I should work very very hard to appease so that I could leave with my life intact. So, Isabel said, dividing up the chicken. Sid tells me you're married. Why couldn't your wife join us? I looked at Sid, who didn't seem to notice the question. He was grabbing Cokes from the fridge. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Valerie is really behind on work, so sadly she couldn't make it. Isabel's glossy hands had articulated fingers. With each of her movements, I could hear the porcelain scrape on its cell. She used tongs to pluck some of the chicken pieces and lay them on my plate. That is a shame. Does your wife often disappoint you? I stared at the meat on my plate, and at the deadness of her pupils. No, not at all. I love her very much, she just... She just gets busy with her job. Isabel doled out the rice next. It was very eerie to watch a doll set the food. Two large portions for the humans, and a tiny portion for herself. Sid tells me that he's had many women disappoint him, and that it's quite common in this day and age. An epidemic. I watched Sid as he handed me the coke and smiled a little sheepishly. Well, I just think girls are a little too picky. Maybe a bit mean. He swept some Warhammer off his chair before sitting down. None of them are as understanding as you, Yiz. He leaned over and gave her a kiss on her white, shiny ear. I shuddered internally. Do you think that's true, Gabriel? Are women disappointments? I had no idea what kind of answer she was seeking. For the record, I don't think women are disappointments, but I wanted to be diplomatic because I got the sense she was siding with my cousin. Everyone's experience with relationships is different, I said. Some people just have bad luck. Isabel brought a chicken piece up to her puppet mouth and lowered her jaw, revealing a tangling mass of micrites. Dozens of tiny black spikes skewered the meat and pulled it into her dark maw. And do you know any of these people with bad luck? She asked, chicken dissolving inside her throat. 
As a matter of fact, I did. Working in construction, I was surrounded by men who would voice their dissatisfaction with the fairer sex. Though, to be honest, most of these men just needed to grow up or stop acting like assholes for these problems to go away. <laughs> yes, I know a lot of guys like this. You do? Isabel's eyes lit up, something in her chest whirred. If this dinner was about placating this doll, this seemed to be the right track. Yeah, it's prevalent at my work. In the trades. Isabel stood up from the table, mimicking the movements of a person rather uncannily. She picked up a box lying near Sid's TV and brought it over to me. It was filled with Hot Wheels, action figures, Warhammer, and other collectible toys. Please, she said. You must offer these men anything they want from this box. Whatever they want. Sid took a sip from his soft drink, eyeing his paraphernalia. But yes, those are pretty rare. I was arranging those for eBay. Isabel's hair began to lift and flutter, as if filled with static, as if a large charge of micrites had entered her head. I could tell Sid was as uncomfortable with this sight as I was. I make you feel happy, don't I, Sidney? My cousin wiped his mouth and practically bowed. Yes, yes, of course, Isabel. You're my pure and chosen. Then don't you think other men deserve to feel happy, too? The dinner only lasted about an hour. Isabel made me promise that I would place the box of toys at my work, which I agreed to. It seemed like a fair price to pay for allowing me to leave alive. I told everyone in my family that Sid was very content with his new partner, and after much consideration, I also told them the truth that his partner was indeed a doll. Sid just does what makes himself happy. Let Sid be Sid, I said. This resulted in the expected shock, embarrassment, and ridicule between my family members. No one wanted to contact my cousin after learning that. Not anytime soon, anyway. Which I think was a good thing, because... It protected Sid from humiliation, but more importantly, it also protected anyone else in my family from meeting Isabel, which was my real intention. I have no clue what sort of microbial slime tech Isabel was made of, or where in the universe she was from, but I certainly didn't trust her in the slightest. The burden I now carry is that I exposed some employees to her essence at my company. I left those colorful, valuable-looking collectibles in the lunchroom portable at my work site. I wish I could tell you they were harmless cars, transformers, and He-Man toys. But even on my drive home, I could see the shimmering black micrites hiding inside all those plastic playthings. I don't know what Isabel intends to do with the additional men she will ensnare. For all I know, she has other porcelain bodies to act as spouses. She might be enthralling hundreds of males to enact something awful. Something truly horrific. But I'm secretly hoping they all just fall in love, keep to themselves, and play Warhammer or something.